Hello, and welcome to another episode of Balanced Body Radio. I'm your host, Casey Ruff, and today we have another amazing guest to reintroduce to you today. Lierre Keith is a returning guest on our show. Be sure to check out her first appearance on episode 67 of Boundless Body Radio. That episode has been one of our most downloaded and most talked about episodes of all time. Lierre is an American writer, radical feminist, food activist, and environmentalist. Lierre is the author of the novels Conditions of War and Skylar Gabriel. Her nonfiction works include the highly acclaimed The Vegetarian Myth, Food, Justice, and Sustainability, which we will be discussing today. She is the co-author of Deep Green Resistance, Strategy to Save the Planet, and she's the editor of the Derek Jensen Reader, Writings on Environmental Revolution. She's also been arrested six times. Super cool. I love that. She currently lives in Northern California. Dear mm-hmm. Keith, what an honor it is to welcome you back to Balanced Body Radio. Well, thanks for having me on again. It was fun the first time, and I'm looking forward to number two. So am I. We're very much looking forward to talking about this more in depth. Um, I was telling you a little bit off the record, you know, being getting prepared for this interview, I listened to your book several times. It knocked my socks off the first time I listened to it. I can remember exactly where I was in certain parts, and making these connections that you had already made was was so um, was so interesting. And re-listening to it again. You know, going back into it, I kind of thought like, okay, I might pick up another thing or two. I've kind of been familiar with your work for a little while, but it it really is shocking. Every single time I listen to it again, I learn more and more and more stuff and how bad this problem is for a lot of people and has become for a lot of people. And we have to point out like your book isn't new. It's been around for a little while. I don't necessarily think we've gone the right direction since you wrote it. What do you think? (laughs) Um, I don't think we've gone the right direction, but I think there are lots of people trying to go in the right direction. And that is helpful because if we can get to the idealistic young people first, um, they won't waste their time and destroy their health doing something utterly useless like going vegan. Um, They can instead join this movement that is really doing its best to repair the earth and also repair human health and human community. Um, We do have a plan. It, It will work. We just need a lot more people to get on board. So my goal is to sort of as much as we can sort of enclose the people with the bad ideas and the fundamentalism that you can't get to them. But out here, if you bump into us, we've got really great information and really good demonstration projects and we can tell you where to go and what to look at and what to examine and what research to read and where to get the good food and how all of that's gonna help. So I feel like we have a very complete, it's very complete now that you could join this whole new movement and it's all there. Um, That didn't exist, you know, when I first went vegan, it was like vegan was the only thing. Now we really do have this whole other world that you could step into and actually do something useful. So, but it's a race to the end. I mean, we are losing 200 species every single day. Um, You know, 200 species a day? Every single day go extinct, 200. Yeah, there are, listen, there are entire parts of China where there's no more flowering plants. And that's because there's no pollinators left all of those animals are gone. All of the insects and the birds and what that did the pollinating are gone. And it's because of agriculture. It's because of monocrop. There's nothing but dust. So if you want vegetables, you have to hand pollinate because there aren't enough insects left to do it. Yeah, that is 500 million years of evolution gone. 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 Wow. Yeah. Wow. That's so interesting. I mean, in your book, you talk about how long it takes to build up topsoil and you're talking you know, thousands and thousands of years to get a few inches. And we can rip through that so quickly with agriculture. It's really sad. Well, that's what agriculture is. That's the problem. Um, wow. That's literally what it is, is you, you have to rip up the prairie or pull down the forest or drain the wetland. So you're removing that perennial polyculture. The purpose of that perennial polyculture is to hold the soil in place and to build more of it. That's what life does to make more of itself. That's the matrix and it's gone. The moment that you do agriculture, you have to destroy it. So that entire biotic community is removed. So right there is your mass extinction. And then you slowly work your way through the topsoil until it's gone. And this is why civilizations only last between 800 and 2000 years, because that's the length of time until the soil is gone and then the whole thing collapses. There have been 34 civilizations. They have all ended in collapse. And this is precisely why it's drawdown. That's the concept that we're looking for. It's called drawdown. It's because you have a certain amount of something and every year there's less of it and you're drawing it down and eventually you hit zero. So no more trees, no more rivers, no more soil. And so it collapses. 
and then it springs up again somewhere else where there's still some more trees and some topsoil and some rivers and then they blow through that area and then move on to the next. So you can follow this around the Mediterranean, for instance, for the last 6,000 years. Um, it's just one empire after another doing exactly that. And now it's pretty much scrub and desert is what's left. Wow, that's so crazy. Yeah. Uh, so last time we talked, we talked a lot about um, you personally, your health, your story with this. Um, we didn't talk as much about the environmental impact of you know vegetarianism, veganism, agriculture, all that stuff. So I definitely want to deep dive into that today. But I do think it's fair to go back and tell your story, how you encountered okay. vegetarianism, veganism, and what that did to your health. I think it's just important to reiterate. Sure. So I became a vegan when I was 16 years old. And I did that in the way that most people do it, which is I met somebody who was a vegan. So I met another teenage girl and her family was all vegan. They were super into being vegan. And within two weeks, she had me convinced. Um, and I was, you know, that kid, I was super impassioned about the state of the world. Um, I felt a lot of despair about what I was seeing even at that age. And it seemed like a complete answer that if I just did this one thing, I could save animals from all this torment, I could save the planet, I could feed all the hungry people, and I could also save my health. So, wow, why not? Why not do this? Um, so I did, and then, I mean, the problem with many of us, this is a problem for human beings generally, is that fundamentalist mindset. Once I was in, I couldn't get out. So I completely wrecked my health. I did it for 20 years. And um, boy, did I live to regret it. So yeah, it's not an appropriate diet, especially long-term for human, humans to build and, and repair and maintain the human body. And it just, it completely failed me. So I ended up with some very serious health problems and many of them are permanent. So yes, let my life be a lesson to you, oh idealistic young person, this is not a way forward. There is an entire generation of us out here who already tried it. And I can tell you it failed us. All. you cannot do this long term without damage so yeah wow we asked you this last time um, and I think I'm going to ask you again today tell us a little bit about um, some of the things that went wrong with your health that ended up coming back when you started reintroducing yeah. animal foods and some of the the more permanent damage that you did health-wise so let's see um probably the most severe thing that never is going to go away is I ended up with degenerative disc disease at five levels of my spine and it's a great four derangement which is as bad as it gets so when the doctors look at my MRI they're like wow you were in a massive car accident like no I wasn't you fell off a roof no skydiving no <laughs> I was a vegan I ate <laughs> kale it looks like it's just like I just ate the completely wrong food for human beings. Wow. And this is where it ends. So I will be in morphine level pain for the rest of my life. There is no way to fix this. That one doesn't come back. Once you destroy your joints, it's gone. Um, you can reduce inflammation. So I'm certainly in less pain than I was when I was a vegan, but it, there's, it's permanent. And I mean, I could get fentanyl tomorrow if I wanted it because it's that bad. Wow. So yeah, but I tell you by the end of my vegan time, I mean, I, I couldn't sit up for more than about a half an hour at a time. And I could only stand up for about three minutes. You know, it's like, so I, all activities were judged in sort of 30 second increments. Um, it's a very, very narrow life. I mean, I spent most of my time lying on the couch and people would come visit me. Um, and it's dramatically better after a year or two of actually eating animal fats and not eating all of those wretched industrial seed oils that create all kinds of inflammation. Um, it just naturally, I didn't repair the discs, but I did reduce the inflammation, which is to say it's a lot less pain. So now it's, I mean, I can sit up for hours at a time and I barely notice, you know, I'm so used to sort of the baseline pain, but it's not like it was at all. And um, I can probably walk about a half an hour at a time. So I can get through airports, which was impossible, you know, before I can go to the movies. I mean, there's all kinds of things that I can do um, that just make your life way bigger. So uh, we'll take what I can get, but it's, you know, it is what it is. I did this. I have to accept it. It was foolish. And I did it long past when the point when a normal person would have said, this is not working um, to re-examine. And I just, this is the problem when you're that sort of fanatic person who is desperate to see a better world, you can back yourself into all kinds of corners. And there's a cult-like element here that we have to acknowledge. And especially I think for people who are vulnerable, for teenagers, you know, it's, you don't have all your frontal lobes aren't there yet. You're very susceptible to peer pressure and all that. And it's the time of life when you feel those things the most strongly 
young people are supposed to be idealistic and impassioned and slightly foolish. And, you know, we just have to save them a bit <laughs> as people who are older, like, don't really need to do this. Anyway, so I did that. Um, the things that got better. Uh, so like many women who are on these kinds of strange low fat diets, I stopped menstruating almost entirely, did a real number on my reproductive organs. If I had wanted to have a baby, there's no conceivable way I could have gotten pregnant. And that is very, very standard for women who eat this way. Um, and I understand that now at the time I didn't, I had no idea what was going on. And all the doctors will say is, well, you can go on birth control pills. That'll make your period still like, I don't want to go on birth control pills. I want to fix what's wrong. Um, but the thing to know is that cholesterol is actually this really life affirming substance. Every single cell in your body needs it. It provides the structural membrane for every cell. Like if you didn't have cholesterol, you'd be a puddle on the floor, I'm not exaggerating. Without it, we just don't have any structure. Um, so cholesterol in your brain is like 80% fat. You need cholesterol to function. It is, I mean, one of the liver's main functions is actually to make cholesterol because we need so much of it. You could never eat enough to make up the deficit. You have to have, I mean, your body just makes so much of it because you need it constantly. Um, your whole digestive tract is lined with it, that final layer. And it's the same with the lungs. There's a very, very sensitive layer, the very top layer of your lungs where the air exchange is done. You, you need cholesterol for that. Um, anyway, I, yeah, so I, I mean, just never got my period. It was, I ended up with fibroids, like all these problems. And that one was really dramatic because I started eating animal products and it started to normalize. But the thing that really did it was the soy. And this is why I hate soy. <laughs> I, I finally like read up on, well, I was still eating a little bit of soy even when I started eating meat again, but it was like, oh, you know, I like this or that, I'm used to this. But then I started to read about soy and I was completely horrified and it's the phytoestrogens because they look like estrogens enough that they will lock onto the receptors in your body, but they're not estrogens and they can't provide what your body actually needs. So it blocks access, your actual estrogens can't get in because these fake ones have taken their spot. So that's the problem. So I, I went cold turkey on soy because it kind of scared me and I'm not exaggerating. Two weeks later, I got my period. From that point till menopause, I did not miss a single period. Wow. That was so dramatic. It was like clockwork after I took the soy out. And I take the cold chill of horror, like what have I done? <laughs> I end up with cancer, like uterine or like any of those female, I'm, I, it's the soy, I'm blaming the soy. So that one went very bad and then it went completely fine once I was eating an appropriate human diet, like just completely cured. Um, so that was a good one. Um, I had such dry skin, it hurt at night and it would like crack and bleed and stuff. And within three days of the first animal product I introduced was eggs, that's very common. Um, and I, within three days of eating eggs, I woke up and it was like, I could bend my arms and legs wow. and it didn't hurt. Like it hurt. And I was so used to it, just hurting. I thought it was normal. It's not normal. Your skin is supposed to flex. And my complexion looks completely different. I remember just running to the mirror multiple times going, look at me. I like, I like have color in my, like I look like a normal person that you might want to mate with. Like I have color. <laughs> I don't like this gray corpse. Like it was amazing. So that one was like, it seems kind of minor, but honestly, your skin hurts all the time. Like you're glad when it stops hurting. And that was an easy fix. Just eat some animal fat. What do you know? Oh, that worked. Um, then I had that whole constellation of like the, the depression and anxiety and the brain fog and like that constant rage that you can't control. And all of that is just because all of your ne neurotransmitters are made from protein and then all of the little docking stations that like make the synapse be a synapse is all fat. So if you don't have protein and fat, your brain simply can't do it. And that's why people on low fat diets have, oh, I mean, just you can look at all the studies about how poor their mental health is, but I mean, they have higher suicide rates, um, they have higher arrest rates, they have higher murder rates, um, you know, just terrible bouts of depression. So I lived with all of that. And the, the example I like to give is if I, if I lost my keys, I would just sit on the floor and cry. It was like, I couldn't handle it. Like something so simple, like, oh, they're somewhere. I just keep looking, you'll find them. But I couldn't do it. I was like, no bounce in my brain. It's just, I had to just collapse for 10 minutes before I could resume the search for my keys. So it's that kind of thing where you just have no, there's just no bounce. There's no way for you to recover from like any tiny 
little problem in life is just completely overwhelming. And then you just fall head first into that pit and there's no crawling out. And I just don't experience that at all anymore. Like reality is not a pit waiting to swallow me. It's like, oh, well, I've lost my keys, whatever. Even if you can't find them, you can figure out what to do. All right, well, I call the whatever and my neighbor has a key and I'm like a locksmith and AAA is there for this. Like they'll come and they'll open your car. Like you don't have to cry, you just move on. It's so simple. It was not simple when I was a vegan. There was nothing wow. there to help me. Wow. So yeah, so stuff like that. Um, oh, I the blood sugar problems. I mean, that's permanent. I completely busted my insulin receptors. So I have to eat a very low carb diet unless I want to suffer. It does not mean that I completely never eat chocolate. I do love chocolate. <laughs> Let's be reasonable. I have to be very careful about you know how much and how many times, and I will absolutely pay the price if I overdo that or any sugar. So that is just a permanent fixture now. It's like low carb or nothing because it's just bad. Some people, if you if you don't do it too long, you can resensitize your insulin receptors. They will come back. Mine are gone. I think they're gone. just completely smooth. <laughs> There's oh. nothing left on the surface of those cells. It's just a done deal. Um, so that one, whatever, I mean, you live with it. Um, I ended up with gastroparesis and this, I can explain that, but it's part of that insulin high insulin low thing that you're doing all day when you're a vegan. And I wrecked my body's capacity to make digestive enzymes because I suppressed them by doing that. So I have to take betaine hydrochloride every day. It's better than it was. Um, but I've been taking that stuff for almost 20 years now and it, I wow. still need it. So, you know, you can bring that back somewhat, but in my case, I'm not sure I'm ever going to get it back all the way, but I don't feel nauseated 24 seven, like I did for a decade and a half. So wow. and, and I have my little cure. I mean, the betaine works if I just take it. So, and I don't need to take that much anymore, but I don't think that's ever going to completely repair. So yeah. that's, just, you know, that's the basic out and there's more, but that's the basic outline. Like, yeah. And these things are all predictable. It's, I know the mechanism. I know exactly what I did and how I did it and why that diet is going to do this to you. If you, yep. if you do this for more than a year or two, you're going to end up with some version of these kinds of problems. And yeah, it's like 90% of people who try this diet, give it up within the first few years. And 84, God. 84 I know, 84% of them say it's because catastrophic health failure. So hopefully uh, most people can at least repair what they've done. If you continue down that road, uh, the rubber will continue to hit that road and you are going to end up like me. So let my life be a teaching moment for all of you yeah. out there. You I was don't, say, it's pointless. You don't have to do this. <laughs> it doesn't help anything. Right, right. No, that's right. And you were not the 85%. You were the 0.001% that continued like white knuckle throttling the thing. I did it. I did it. Yeah. And I was so determined. And it just, it was every one of my friends had already given it up they're like Lear, you just have to face facts and i was like no there has to be a way and it, there wasn't yeah because like it's, it's evolution this is who we've been for two million years it's not yeah. good you can't will it away it's reality it really occurred to me listening to your book again this last time and the style that you wrote it of like kind of addressing how you were coming to grips with some of these things as the process went. Like, I don't know when you decided to write the book. It must have been well after you gave it up. But you, the way you wrote it was like, you you wrote it in a style of like, I was thinking about these things. I was trying to make this work. This were the, the mental gymnastics I was doing. And all the while, like the story of the bowl of, of sour cream dip or the bagel <laughs> with double cream cheese. Like that must have been like, oh my God, those cravings were just like, smashing like a cube of butter or something with yeah. like it sounded like they were through the roof it's horrible and i also mentioned that book reading this account of people who had survived a japanese prison camp and then they get back into i don't know it was america or england it was one or the other and they're presented with this feast and all they eat is the fat they eat every drop of fat off that table and then they like poke their heads up and look at okay what else is here because the craving for fat is so intense and I can so relate to that because that's what it was like when you saw animal fat on the table, it was like, don't even look at it because you know, you're going to be craving and you feel like a horrible person for even thinking about it. Cause you, now you're the evil oppressor who's hurting animals. Um, and it also makes no sense because you're not supposed to feel this. So why do I feel this so strongly? Yeah. And there was that period when I was, I think I was 24, 25 and I was getting for six weeks twice a week, I stopped and got that bagel with the double cream cheese. And at the end of six weeks, it was like, this is horrible. You have to stop. 
it's, you know, you're completely betraying everything, you're hurting the animals and you're, you know, everything's gonna collapse if you keep down this path. And the only way to stop doing it was to change the way I walked so that I wasn't going by that place where they sold it because I could not stop thinking about that cream cheese. It was all I could think about. It's like, this is starvation, what you're doing to yourself. That's not normal. You shouldn't be obsessed with cream cheese. But I was like, please just give me some more fat, please. Cause I would feel so good for like two hours after eating it. And then I just, I yanked myself back from sanity. It was like, don't do it. It's a terrible, terrible thing. You can't wow. oppress the animals, don't, you know? So I was like, I, I made myself, like I said, the white knuckling is like, just don't, don't do it. Don't walk there. Don't think about it. Drive it from your mind. And then, you know, it'd be like years, two, two, three years would go by. I was like, I had kept it that much under control, but then the next little temptation would come up and you'd be like, oh, I want that piece of cheese. Please let me have some of that. And I'm like, uh, you know, split a piece of pizza with someone and then feel like the most horrible person on the planet because you had yeah. been in. It's awful. It's just an eating disorder. That's all it is. Yeah. The guilt and the cognitive dissonance of but, just yes. feeling terrible. What, what yeah. I believe and my actions are not jiving, that's a huge problem. Huge problem in our, in our feeble brains. Yeah. Yeah, that's crazy. Well, I, I really appreciate you telling your story and, and relating some of the health issues. I did want to talk about the environmental issues because I, I, I said this last time, and I, I believe this this time as well, and I know you do too. People go vegetarian and vegan for the very best mm -hmm. reasons. Thank so you. noble, so caring. They love the animals. They love the planet. They want to do their part. And everybody knows exactly. Look at those fur babies. Oh, yeah. <laughs> cute. <laughs> we, we love the animals. We love the planet. We, we want to do the right thing. And so we get sucked into this story of like animal agriculture is terrible. Agriculture of plants is so much better and it saves the planet. And I want to go back to one particular really influential moment in your life where you saw I, I believe it was a professor or a teacher of some kind that wrote agriculture equals culture and like or civilization and it's like civilization is amazing and we have Mona Lisa and great music and all this stuff and it's like that came from agriculture amazing why why, why would we not think agriculture is the best thing ever right and so that's the story and it's very sort of ennobling you know so oh, look at human progress look what we did we were all starving and freezing and terrible and we wallowed in the mud and we lived in caves and whatever and then we figured this thing out how to get our own food and from there stability was inserted into human lives and we were able to have um you know divisions of labor and people were able to specialize and then they learned how to do all these things like music and pottery governments and, and religions yeah, and all these great <laughs> wonderful prisons and mass starvation <laughs> and war and slavery right all of this actually wrecked human culture but that's not the story we're told. So, so we have to start from the very beginning. What is agriculture? Well, you take a piece of land, you clear every living thing off it, and I mean down to the bacteria, and then you plant that land just for humans. So right away, you've got the mass extinction problem because all those plants and animals have nowhere to go. They're just sent off into the dark night of extinction, never to be seen again. And that's what it's done around the globe. It, agriculture has taken every conceivable inch that it could take. There's mm -hmm. nothing left. Like all the continents that could be breached are gone. Um, Antarctica, but you know, hey, we're gonna get that one with global warming. Um, but that's it, that's all that's left. So, <laughs> and then what happens? Well, now the problem is we've mentioned drawdown. You're on drawdown because you what you have is like, there's a, it makes the city possible because you've got all these people that don't have to grow food. Other people are growing it. But now you're dependent on the hinterlands. You're always dependent on the colonies because that city, if you think about it, everything has to come from somewhere else. The food, the water, the trees, energy, fish, whatever you're doing, whatever you're eating, it all has to come from somewhere else. Think about New York. There's no food. You can't grow food. It's nothing but concrete, stone, whatever, like buildings. You know, there's no, it, it's not where food comes from. So it all has to be imported. And now the problem is you're dependent on this supply chain. And what if the people who live next door don't wanna give you their food, their soil, their trees, their water, their fish, and they don't, nobody willingly gives up their stuff to give to you. Um, and so from that point forward, it doesn't actually matter what beautiful values people in the city might hold in their hearts. You are dependent on imperialism and genocide. You have to conquer your neighbors because you've used up your stuff you have to conquer your neighbors and take their stuff. 
And part of their stuff is, of course, human beings, because it's backbreaking labor, agriculture. It's just dawn to dusk. Um, and for anyone to have leisure, you have to have slaves. So, you know, we think of places like Athens in ancient Greece, one of the birthplaces of democracy. Well, you know, 94% of the population was literally slaves. That's right. So you're, just, you're only talking about 6% of the population that got to be citizens. They got to do all that great stuff. And they did some marvelous things and they built some amazing buildings and there's beautiful statues. And I can certainly, you know, appreciate that. But that's what it rests on is slavery. And the only reason we've forgotten this is because for 200 years, we've been using fossil fuel instead. So we were able to get rid of slavery, but that's why. The year 1800, which is when slavery began, uh, the fossil fuel age begins, is when we start really using coal. Um, at that point, year 1800, fully three quarters of the human beings on this planet, three quarters were living in some form of slavery, indenture, or serfdom, three quarters. Wow. That's what agriculture demands. And if you ever try it, you will see that this is true. Um, yes, and then you're on drawdown. So you're using up all your stuff and then you're desperate and you're living in a city. So you've got way too many people will never be supported on what land is there. And so you have to go out and steal stuff. So now you need a military. And then when you get all that stuff back, you need someone to protect it. So you're gonna call that either the military or the police. And also you can't have vast numbers of people in slavery without a military. And now you're gonna need a government. You're gonna need a hierarchy. You're gonna need someone to administer it. And now you're gonna need laws because you've got thousands if not millions of strangers all living together, tightly packed. And you need some way for them to settle disputes without murdering each other. So Hammurabi's code comes into being because you can't just sit face to face. There's this number, I can't remember the guy's name, it's somebody's number. And that's the point past which humans break down in communication. And it's usually like about 100, 125. 150, I think is yeah, what I've heard. You can have about that many and there's, the relationships at that point aren't too complex. You actually can make decisions face to face. And that's basically the hunter gatherer number. That's, you know, that's how we evolved is in those small family bands. And that just, you bust right through that and it's impossible. You can't have 10,000 or 100,000 or a million people sit face to face and make decisions. It just it can't be done. So yeah. you have to have some kind of formal law. The state has to be the only thing that can, can enforce with violence. Everybody else has to give up violence so that otherwise we're all just gonna murder each other, right? So you see how it comes into being. You have the social contract. It's better than nothing, but <laughs> we didn't always live this way. There's another way. And, you know, we two and a half million years we were on this planet and we didn't wreck the place. We didn't destroy right. it. And That's we right. were basically pretty nice to each other for the most part. I'm not saying it was perfect, but it's a very different worldview and a very different kind of um, culture. And it's not civilization. It's, some, it's another kind of, it's a culture, but it's not civilization. Civilization right. is agriculture and cities. Civilization literally means a way of life based on cities. That's etymological. Yeah. What it means so right. when people say oh civilization i don't mean to insult hunter gatherers they have very complicated cultures it's just not civilization and that's a good thing because they're actually sustainable and civilization is the problem as far as i'm concerned yeah. so anyway you wreck the place and then you move on and you wreck other places and then you move on and you wreck the next place so 34 times we've done this around the globe it always collapses and it always ends in mass starvation the last proteins in the cooking pots are human because starving people will eat corpses if they have to. Um, and that's just a function of it. That's where it always ends is in collapse. Now, we've extended that by figuring out very stupidly that we could eat fossil fuel. So right now, almost half of the nitrogen, any human being around the globe, if you tested the nitrogen in their bodies, almost half of it is directly from fossil fuel. It's, oh, good. Yeah, nitrogen is from oil and gas. So it's the Haber-Bosch process. They figured it out to make weapons in World War II. And then they just turned those um, fertilizer, the um, weapons plants into making fertilizer instead. And a lot of the scientists were like, yay, we figured it out. Because even by the end of the 19th century, a lot of scientists were like, we have a problem. We're running out of nitrogen. How are we gonna grow food for all the people? Because there's too many of us. Um, and that was the solution. Of course, it's temporary because now we're just drawing down another substance that can't be replaced. Fossil fuel, not gonna end any other way. It's just since what they call the green revolution, which was all based on that kind of fossil fuel fertilizer, the human population has quadrupled. So we haven't solved the problem. We've just extended it and now it's four times worse. 
got that many more people. So yeah, there are solutions. I am not without hope. Um, and the solutions are actually really nice solutions. We don't really have to do anything terrible to each other. We could fix this. It's just, are we gonna? And that's always the thing. Like what we lack is analysis on one level, but really political will. And do we have it? And I don't think we do. I don't I think, think we most, do. I think most people are way too bought in. This is Lewis Mumford. If you ever want to read his work, he's a fantastic critic of, he has books that really go into sort of the deep history of civilization and why this was a very bad idea um, and how it leads, leads to this kind of hierarchy and militarization and what he calls the mega machine, which is turning humans into parts of machines. Um, and that's what ancient civilizations did. They were able to harness the amount of energy that humans can make available um, by turning us into little cogs. And so having a, a military bureaucracy and a civic bureaucracy, you know, we're able, humans were able to do things that had never been done before. And so it was, he talks about monuments on a scale that was inconceivable, but also destruction on a scale that they had never conceived of either. So it's things like building the pyramids, but also making vast irrigation channels in places like Egypt um, that of course destroy the Nile and destroy the soil. Everything gets salinated from, you know, the constant agriculture. So it's both. And of course it rests on human misery. So that's his work. So that's, but the best essay that he wrote is called um, Authoritarian and Democratic Techniques. And it's a little, it's like eight pages. So all of his work is condensed into that essay. And wow. that's, that's his point is that, um, you know, it's to, in order to do these things, you have to have this very destructive hierarchy and it turns people into a part of a machine. And now the reason we do it is he calls it the magnificent bribe because we've been given, at least in, you know, if you're in the wealthy countries, what you get is this just endless supply of goodies that have never even existed before. You know, like ice cream 24 seven, <laughs> cell phones, computers, um, you know, central heat, like hot water on demand, like all kinds of things that God knows we enjoy. Um, but the trade-off is A, our humanity and B, our planet. <laughs> We've only got one and we're trashing it for this. So yeah. it's well worth reading his essay, Authoritarian mm. and Democratic Techniques, but that's what he called it is the magnificent bribe. And that's what we've all fallen for. So we yeah. got to give up the magnificent bribe and just, we have to be, as James Howard Kunstler says, reality-based adults. Our planet cannot endure this much longer. We yeah. are up the brink. So anyway, agriculture is where, where the damage starts. And that was one of my points in writing my book was I really wanted the people who cared the most about the planet to understand the nature of the problem because they've been giving the solution, which is, oh, eat agricultural foods, that will save it. It's like, that's the problem. That's not gonna save anything. That's literally the problem. It's yeah. how we've been destroying the planet and we need to repair the planet, not keep destroying it. Also not a plan with the future because we're out of topsoil and we will very soon be out of fossil fuel. And then what? Like you haven't solved anything. Right. So. Yeah, that's right. No, all of those concepts are so interesting. And it's why, like, if you go to an indigenous tribe, the few that we haven't, you know, plowed over and shoved Bibles down their throat at this point, right. like you ask them some of these concepts that for us, we don't even think about, like, of course, there's government, of course, there's religions, of course, there's, you know, all of these things that we've created, we don't know any different. You talk to them about, you know, currency and slavery and wars, and they're like, they don't even know what the hell you're talking yeah. about, because they just see the earth from an animus perspective, where, you know, there's, there's lives and, you know, you take what you need and you give back what you need and you can just live in that symbiotic relationship and the world just kind of goes versus what we're dealing with now. I mean, I got, I got blasted for making this point on social media. I was at the grocery store buying a pound of ground beef and there was a family in front of me that absolutely loaded up the conveyor belt as full as they can with all kinds of different plant-based products, all the vegetables, like cauliflower in plastic packages put into a plastic sack to be put into a plastic bag yeah. yeah soy milk um tons of different uh -huh. products and all these things like like and i'm sitting here with a pound of beef and like i i'm you know the bad guy for buying the beef but look at all this stuff and when and where and how did all of this get here like the sprouts employee did not walk to the back and pick a head of cauliflower for you who knows when where how that was harvested and how it got to this place people don't consider that because we're used to it well, I can tell you who harvested it was probably a Mexican immigrant making absolute shit money. Yeah, um, sprayed with chemicals while he's family. in the field. No, yeah. Yeah, so it's sad. sad. Yeah, and also that land is being destroyed. It was destroyed to plant the cauliflower. The river was destroyed. The water table is being destroyed. The soil is being destroyed. 
There is no future in cauliflower. I hate to tell you, it is not the good, green, marvelous, peaceful food that you want it to be. It is not. Entire ecosystems were destroyed for it. Meanwhile, if you have grass-fed ground beef, you are repairing all of that. And that's what they need to understand, that agriculture is the food that is destroying the entire cycle of life. And there is food that supports the cycle of life, that participates in the cycle of life. And so our job is to figure out the difference and then as much as we can support this kind of thing, right? Um, and so the real question is, does your food build topsoil? If you can just get it down to one question, that would be it. Because if, it, if the answer is yes, you are repairing the planet because everything else has to be in place for that soil to be repaired. If your food is destroying topsoil, you gotta give it up. So, I mean, all of us, we have to give it up. I'm like one individual, like it doesn't really matter that much, but as a, as a culture, that's what we need to do. And as a planet, as a, as a species, as humanity, that's what we have to do is give that up because it was a very bad path. Um, and Jared Diamond, who won a Pulitzer Prize, he has this great quote. It's like, he wrote this famous article that agriculture is the worst mistake hum humans have ever made. And he's right because all of the ills that follow, the environmental destruction, the militarism, the war, the slavery, um, the sexual hierarchy, like everything falls from, from that point forward. That's what we did. So yeah, so this thing about, about the topsoil. So this is, these are the concepts that people need to grapple with. And I know this is a lot of information. It took me many, many years to come to terms with this. So I'm just stick with me here. All right, so two words, perennial polyculture. Perennial means plants that live a long time. And polyculture means many, many plants all living in the same place together. And they have relationships with each other and they communicate with each other and they make each other stronger. And that's what polycultures are. And their basic job is building more soil. Because this is, is literal. Just, it's important to say this literally. is absolutely literal. This is not woo-woo, this is not bullshit. Nope. This is nope. science. This is literal plants communicating with other plants. And it's amazing. And how they do it is mostly with chemical messengers. Um, you know, we talk and we hear, and that's great. Or we use sign if, you know, we're deaf. Or, but we have ways that we communicate, and that is how plants do it. Um, they are experts in chemical communication and chemical warfare. And that's how they fight back, too. That's how they drive off plants. That's how they, or um, how they drive off insects. That's how they drive off mammals. They, they, and they warn each other. Like if one plant is getting eaten by, say, a deer is nibbling, they'll send out the message. It's like, we're getting eaten. Toughen yourselves up. And uh, all the plants in the neighborhood are like, okay, I'm on it. And then they start producing chemicals that will um, taste terrible to deer, that will poison deer, and that also make themselves stiffer so that they're not as good to eat. And they'll do that pretty instantly. But it's because there's a warning signal um, and the plants take care of each other, just like we do. You know, oh, there's a fire, get ready, everybody. Like, you know, we know what to do. And it's the same thing. Like they just warn each other. Um, plants are like, that's amazing. And the more we know about plant communication, it's just, it's extraordinary how, they, and they build communities and there are plants that are like the basis of the community. And when, when one of them gets established, they will call to the others. They will say, these are the seeds that need to come here. And we have no idea how the seeds do that. Um, but it's not random what ends up in a patch of bare ground. That has been established. How they know where to go and how they get there since they can't walk, we have no idea. Um, it may be that other animals are helping, that they get some of these signals as well. Who knows, but it's super cool. Um, anyway, I know, right? This looks, plants are amazing. Um, anyway, so yeah, perennial polyculture. So perennial live a long time. Now there's a reason for that. And it is because if you think about a tree, um, there's no tree that could grow that big in one year. So they're not annuals. They can't be annuals. They have a long, long time to get that big. Where I live, it's the redwood forest. These trees are 2000 years old. I mean, they're older than Christianity. That's pretty cool. Um, but nobody can do that in one season. So annual crops, if you think about annuals, um, there are some annual grasses, we'll get to that. But you know, when most people think of annual, annuals, it's like tomatoes, you know, it's like things you might grow in your garden. Um, there's some very, in tropical climates, they'd be tender perennials, but here they're annuals because they're gonna die the moment there's frost. So things like whatever, pansies, like snapdragons, like whatever you're growing in you know, your flower garden, a lot of them are gonna be annuals. Um, so they don't, they don't live very long. And so they have very different reproductive strategies because of the time difference. So for things like trees and grasses, um, they have time to build really elaborate bodies and really elaborate root systems. So many, many years can go into this. And if you can go online and see pictures of this, but there are people who have done demonstration projects where they show a grassland and then the roots and the roots can go down 12 feet into the soil. And it's amazing. amazing. Yeah, and it's an incredibly complicated 
interwoven mat of roots, you could never get through it. I mean, they didn't actually do the, the quote, great plowing. That didn't actually happen across the plains here until the steel plow was invented. They couldn't do it with just like wooden plows. And even it, other kinds of metal were too soft. It wasn't until John Deere came along and made that horrifying steel plow. That was when they were finally able to bust up those roots. But until that, nothing could cut through it. I mean, it's just so dense with roots, but that's what it takes to build soil and to protect soil. So here you have these root systems that go down. It's literally the matrix that holds soil in place, but they do other things too. So one thing is it provides an actual physical channel for rain to enter the soil. That's how water actually gets in is down the root. Um, and the roots help too, because they kind of suck it down, but it's just physically, that's how it gets in. It can't do, rain can't get in otherwise. And if you just say you just drive by or walk by a parking lot, you know, somewhere in your town and there's like some bare ground that's been driven over a bunch of times, what you'll see is just pools of water, right? Has no way to enter the soil. And then look over where there's grass next door and you will not see a pool of water. Why? Because it can get in and that's how is through the roots. Um, and then the other thing that roots do is they can actually get down to where the rock is if they're big enough, if they're long enough. And that's perennial roots are the only ones that are long enough. Um, and they get down to the bedrock and then they can actually break up rock. Um, and they're not doing that alone. Oh. They're doing it symbiotically with certain bacteria that actually provide the acids that will degrade the rock. So, and then the plant, they're trading. So the plant is, is giving the bacteria some sugar and then the bacteria is giving the plant the minerals. We have no way to access those minerals. You and I cannot eat rock. You wouldn't know that from some of the food I ate. <laughs> <laughs> that is pretty crunchy, but um, we can't actually eat rock. We all know that we don't have teeth to eat rock, but those are the creatures that do it. And they pull those minerals up into their the rest of their bodies. And then they make those minerals available to the rest of the life community, the living community. So we owe all of that to plants, to perennial plants. Um, and annuals don't do all that. They can't, they're not big enough. Uh, what annuals do is very important. And their moment is when there's an emergency. So for some reason, the ground is bare, fire, flood, earthquake, landslide, whatever. There, there are moments in nature when there's just bare ground, but it's an emergency for life. And you want it covered as quickly as possible. And that's when the annuals have their moment. Now, because they only live you know, a few short seasons, they have to put, all, I mean, their whole future depends on the seed. That's their only reproductive strategy. And the seed has to be big. And that's why the seeds of, of annual plants tend to be way bigger than the seeds of perennial plants. Because perennial plants can spread a whole bunch of ways like roots by runner. Um, where I live in the redwood forest, the redwood trees fall. They have pine cones. Every once in a while you see them sprouting, but their main way of reproducing is the old tree falls um, just flat on the ground when it's dead, when it's dying. And then there are burls along the surface of the bark. And then those will shoot up and make the new baby trees come up out what? of that. Yeah, yeah. A lot wow. of trees do that. That's mainly no how redwood plants reproduce. Like I said, they have these giant pine cones. You can see them sometimes, but that's way more popular is, is the burl method. Um, anyway, they have many, many strategies. Or I have these like Himalayan blackberries that are very invasive here super yummy in August, but they are, they will spread <laughs> everywhere. But how they spread is by runner. I mean, mm. every little, you know, those berries that you eat, they are covered in seeds. You can see the little tiny seeds, but that's not their main strategy. I mean, sure, some of those somewhere, birds will eat them and poop them out and they're gonna spread that way, but it's mostly by runner. If I don't keep up on this, it doesn't take a year, like the entire field wow. is just covered in these blackberries. Wow. So I'm like constantly hacking them back. I don't wanna pull them all out because I do love them, but. <laughs> And it's such a job getting them out of the ground. Anyway, um, yeah, so that's what the, that's the annual perennial thing. So the, the annuals have these big seeds and when the ground is cleared through an emergency, that's their moment because they don't have to compete against that, that root mat of the perennials and they can actually do it. They can take over that land very, very briefly. So all of a sudden it'll be covered in the, in the annuals. So I, I say this is like, a, if you cut yourself, and you need a Band-Aid or you know, stitches even. That's the annuals, right? You have the emergency, you've cut yourself, and then you put something that sort of holds it together. Eventually your skin though does its repair and you don't need that bandage of those stitches. It's the same thing. The ground is bare, that's a real problem. In come the annuals, that's the Band-Aid. They cover that ground temporarily so you don't lose any more soil. 
you know, they keep it as healthy as they can. Eventually though, the perennials come back and they will take over. Um, and that's why river valleys are known for being places where there are tons and tons of annual plants because there's that constant emergency of the flooding. And so a lot of annuals, um, that's just sort of their na native habitat. So all the things that we eat as like wheat and corn or whatever, they all started as grasses on river valleys like that. And then eventually people domesticated them. But the point is that their seed heads were big enough that it was sort of maybe worth harvesting for humans because the, the seeds of annuals just aren't big or perennials just aren't big enough. There's not worth it. But the annual seeds, yeah, now you're pushing something that's worth the energy of harvesting it and then processing it to make it edible for humans. Some of them are just barely big enough that it was worth it. The real problem is they're addictive and they are. And a lot of us know exactly how addictive wheat especially yeah. is, but they all are. And as far as I can tell, that's the reason we actually did this to ourselves because none of the other explanations make sense. As Colin Tudge says, he's in the the London School of Economics, he says, the real question is why anybody took it up at all, agriculture, why anybody took it up at all, because it's so obviously beastly. And I love that, <laughs> it's so British. But um, <laughs> that's the reason, it's because they're addictive. We get a little hit of, of morphine, essentially. They turn into, for gluten, as gluteomorphins is what happens in our guts. They're, they're transformed into these very addictive, morphine-like substances, and we wanted more. So we just, started eating them and then kept going because um, it's a wretched way of life and it destroyed everything but hey it sure feels good when you eat them um, yeah, i've been right. eating for, for over a decade and it was like the best thing i ever did because one bite and it was like that's it i have to eat the whole box whatever it is mm -hmm. like there's bagels on the other side of cat town they're like calling my name <laughs> You go, you can get five or six now. I was like, no, don't do it. Now it's just like, nope, it's not even food. And it, oh my God, it's such a relief. But anyway, I, I think this is true because I've experienced it. I know how addictive those things are. Um, anyway, that's, that's the problem. But perennial polyculture, that's what nature does. And I don't care whether it's a grassland, whether it's a forest, whether it's tundra, whether it's a wetland, it's the same pattern. You have perennial polycultures, and animals integrated into perennial polycultures. That is nature's model. And that is what nature tries to do over and over again. We destroy it, we do agriculture, and then around the edges, it's always trying to get back in. It just wants to come home. All yeah. of, whether it's prairie grasses, whether it's a forest, whatever it is, it, it wants to come back. Um, and we fight that secession by doing, it's a war by fighting with the, the weapons of agriculture. It's like, keep pushing it back, keep pushing it back. Don't let it come back, <laughs> come home because we need this land now. So repair is what we have to do. And that means we have to put down the weapons of war and that would be the plow. Stop doing it, let the grasses come back and, or the forest. What happens then? Well, you can't really have a grassland without ruminants. I know Australia sort of has its own thing. We're gonna leave Australia out of this, but for the, the rest of the grasslands, it's ruminants and grasses together are what make grasslands possible. So grasses are not forests. And the reason is because it's dry. Where it's wetter, you will get forests. Where it's dry, you have a grassland. And grasses are really good at that because most of the activity of a grassland happens underground where it's cooler and where you have moisture over those long, long, long hot summers. And that's one of the things that they, the roots do by building all that topsoil. It's like a giant sponge. So it absorbs all that water in the spring and honestly holds onto it for a very long time. Um, and bit by bit, the roots can bring it up, you know, and keep the plant alive. Eventually it goes dormant because it's just too dry and too hot. But underneath, you know, the surface, there's still all this biological activity going on. And then, you know, in the fall when it's cooler and there's rain again, it'll green up again. Um, but during that long season where there's not much going on, um, the creatures that evolved to help it not die <laughs> are ruminant. So ruminants have, well, like, a cow, for instance, has a four-chambered stomach and it's, it's neutral, the pH is neutral. We have very acid stomachs. That's one of the reasons we know that we are carnivores. Um, they don't, they have this very neutral stomach. And the reason is because they're a vat for bacteria. That's the reason it's neutral. They need to carry around all this bacteria. So there was a relationship that was built billions of years ago between animals and plants. And this is one of um, you know, the, the, the great, ways that 
uh, species work together in these symbiotic relationships. So sort of the glorious results are here. You have grasses, you have bacteria, and you have a ruminant. So inside the ruminant, the, the, the bacteria came to live. And the ruminant says, I will provide a beautiful environment for you. It'll be nice and neutral. We will not kill you with acid. And in exchange, I'm gonna feed you cellulose, which is very, very low uh, nutrient. There's really not much in it except cellulose. It's just fiber. And the bacteria said, I know how to digest that. Let me do it for you. And then there's a trade-off. So the bacteria gets the cellulose and in exchange, it makes um, substances that are essentially high fat, high protein. And that's what the cow is eating. So the cow is basically farming <laughs> the bacteria but you could also say the other way around that the bacteria is farming the cows and getting food by exploiting the cow. At the end of the day, again, these are symbiotic relationships. They are both helping each other. And of course the grass needs them both because without somebody to keep the biological cycle going, the grasses would die. It would, it would be nothing, there would be nothing left. If you take ruminants off a of grassland, that's what happens. Yeah. Um, just by all that happens is the, you know, the, the dead matter piles up and, around the, the base point of each plant, it just dies because it gets covered in this. It, there's no way for it to degrade except mechanical weathering, which doesn't go very quickly. So you'll have more and more space between each plant that's just bare ground. And eventually you just have desert. So everybody dies if you don't have ruminants. Um, and that's the relationships they all built with each other. And grasses are, are absolutely meant to be grazed. Um, when they are grazed, it stimulates root growth. So, and you probably know this yourself, if you've grown any kind of flowering plant that's a perennial, when you clip it back, you get more growth. Like that's one of the things that you do is you clip it back because sometimes you want more flowers and that's what you'll get. But it stimulates, especially the root growth. There's in the saliva, there's enzymes um, from cows and bison and whatnot that actually helps the plant grow. It sends the signal, hey, get more roots going. Um, so they help each other in that way. But grasses are different than other plants. Like I'm looking outside my window and I see all these trees and the tip of every branch is a different color green. And that's this year's growth. It's a very bright green and the other greens are darker. So it's a very bright green. So they grow from the outer point outward, right? That's how trees grow. Not true for grasses. They grow from the bottom up, not from the tip up. They grow from the bottom up. They're expecting to be grazed. If growth only happened at the top and you cut it, that would be the end. It would then have to put out a whole bunch more leaders and try its best and it would be kind of crooked and weak. That's what happens with trees. Um, but it's not that way. It's millions of years ago they figured this out. I will grow from the bottom up and then you can come and graze, graze me and it will only stimulate me to grow better and more and stronger and denser. And that's what they do together. And then you've got the bacteria doing its thing and the bison are all healthy and the grasses are healthy. And every year there's more topsoil. Yep. Every year there's more. So yep. you could come back 10,000 years from now and all you'd find would be more of the same, stronger and denser and better. Um, yep. Go back 10,000 years, there's not a single piece of agriculture that's lasted that long. By 2,000 years, it's over. It's just yep. dead, it's desert. Um, yep. So the deserts on the planet are human made and that's how they were made is through agriculture. So you can be part of this, this cycle. And the trick is to go to places where people are repairing by using grass-based farming. So that's your best bet. And usually the more species involved, the better. So the, really the best farms have things like bison or cows, and then they'll also have pigs, and then they'll also have chickens or geese or ducks or guinea fowl. And in nature, fowl always follow along with the ruminants for lots right. of reasons, um, but they keep each other healthy. Again, it's these symbiotic relationships. Yep. And like one thing they do is they love to pick apart the manure and eat the bugs out. And what that means is that the ruminant as a herd, they're way healthier because it's, it's interrupting the cycle of the, you know, whatever pests or intestinal parasites or whatever. And the birds break that up by eating them. They love eating insects, that's what they do. So they'll scrounge through the, the manure and they'll eat out the, the insects or the insect eggs. And that keeps all the ruminants way healthier. Um, there's birds that just fly around on the backs of various animals and um, like to pick the ticks off them or eat things like, you know, little parasites that get in their ears or even clean their teeth, which is an amazing, amazing thing to watch. But again, it's very these symbiotic relationships. So the more species, the better. It's always going to be better with more. Yeah. You can go to these farms and you can see they are building topsoil year by year. And that's the most important thing.
because all of life depends on it. And also it is the only way we're gonna sequester the carbon. It is the yeah. only way. The grasses and the ruminants can do this. If we were to repair even 80% of the world's trashed over grasslands, and we have to repair them by giving up agriculture. I'm just gonna say that again, we have to stop plowing. We have to let the grasses and the ruminants come home. But if we were to do that across maybe 80% of the world's trashed out grasslands, it would take any 12 to 15 years, we could sequester all of the carbon that's been released since the beginning of the industrial age. All of all we have to do is let the grasses and the ruminants come home, which is yep. what they want. They just want to come back. Yep. We just have to let them. Yep. I, in my in my I love videos where you see the bison return and like, like you know, I mean Native American tribe that finally got their first herd back and they come pouring down the, you know, whatever, the little ramp. You're like, yes, yes, they're back. back. <laughs> do this. You are the only people who can do this. Um, really all we have to do is get out of the way. We, we can help transport them, it happens faster, but if we were just to let it go, it would all come back. Yeah. They yeah. know how to do this. We don't. Yeah. Yeah. We don't know how. We can help a tiny bit, but they're going to do it. They know how to make it happen. Yeah, um, and that's, that's amazing. It. So we just have to get on board. Yeah. We can still do this. Like Alan Savory says, we're not out of time, but we are running out of time. So yeah. we're running out of time. If you care about this planet, you need to understand this. You need to understand grasses, ruminants, bacteria. You need to understand grass-based farming and repairing, repairing the soil. Because yep. this can be done. This can be yep. done. That's right. And if you don't believe it or you've never seen it in action, please, 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 please go watch The Biggest Little Farm to see this in action. I love that documentary. I've watched it probably 17 times. It's amazing where they take this dead, completely yep. sterile piece of earth and with diversity and all these different species, they build it back and the topsoil returns and all these plants and animals are happy and they work together and they solve the issues that come up and it's absolutely beautiful and amazing to watch. And, and I, I completely agree with you that it, this can be done for an individual, for somebody that's listening to this, they're not a farmer, they live in a city maybe, um, they still have to get their food from a grocery store. What would you say to the average listener, what can I do on an individual level to do my part? Okay, so the first thing, which is gonna feel very satisfying and will also help your body is to figure out how to get the best possible food. The food that is from these grass-based farms. It's amazing, but what do you know? It completely matches the needs of the human template. And it is because we evolved on the African savanna eating those animals that ate the grasses. So of course it matches us perfectly. That makes total sense, right? So you can find that at the store. More and more, you can find things that are labeled you know, grass-based, like it'll be grass-fed beef or grass-based, you'll, like you'll see it on the milk cart and it'll say, you know, it's a grass-based dairy. Do some research and just make sure if you want, because sometimes, you know, these things aren't legally defined and you may not be getting what you think you're getting, but more or less you can depend on it. And if it's a decent farm, they'll tell you, they'll answer your questions. They'll tell you exactly what they're doing. And you can often go visit, which is an amazing thing, because now you have a personal relationship with that soil and those animals and that farmer. And that's a, a really great thing to do. Um, so, and if you can't find in the store all the things that you want, and I know it's hard, but do a little research. And the best site that I recommend is, it's called eatwild.com. And it's run by a woman named Jo Robinson. And she's written a whole bunch of books all about these subjects. She just absolutely lays it out for, you know, the average civilian. You don't have to be a scientist. You don't have to be a farmer. You don't have to be a doctor. Just why this works, how it works, why it's good for you, you know no other good food on this is the best food ever and she will explain why and then she runs this amazing website and you can go state by state in the united states pick where you live and then look at all the farms that are listed there and what they sell and if it's something you want and how to get it do they do farmers market do they deliver can you go to the farm and you can make arrangements to go get the food and it's really fun so you might need to get a big freezer which can be a pain if you live in an apartment, but I've done it in an apartment. You can get like a little cube freezer and you can buy, you know, a quarter of a cow or half a cow, split it with your friends. Um, and now you have the best food in the world that is repairing everything. It's repairing the soil, it's repairing um, the water tables being um, recharged. You're, re you're saving the local waterways because if you're building soil and you're protecting soil, it means it's not running off into the local streams, which means the fish can come back now. They can't survive being choked like that. But now that local stream can come back to life as well. Um, yeah, so all of that is happening. And if you have a grass-based farm, it means all the other animals get to live there too. So it's not just cows. Like you'll have all of these other, the ground-dwelling birds come back, the migratory birds can come back. 
um, they can build little nests, they can have their lives, amphibians, reptiles, even sometimes larger mammals, it, everybody has a place to live. There's so few animals that can live in a cornfield. And the problem too is that, I mean, you can talk to anybody who's ever had to run one of those carbines at harvest time, it's hell. Because as you go through, they say it's a thousand animals per acre is being ground up in that machine. Oh my God. That's what goes into your wheat and your corn and your soy. Um, but they said the worst part is when you get to the very end because there'll be that last few acres and every animal that's been got has been able to get away has wow. run there just in absolute terror because they know they're about to be killed by this giant machine. Um, and so they're all there in that last acre. It's the last acre is hell because there's nothing but dead animal bodies the entire way through. I never considered that. That is awful. It's And people that I know who have had to do this, like they're so traumatized even 20 years later about how- Oh my God. That last acre or two where all the animals have gone to hide. Oh my and God. That's what you're eating when you eat wheat or rice or soy or whatever. It, it, there's nothing vegan about this. That is your food. So anyway, it's horrible. But if you have grass-based farming, you never have to own one of those machines. You just don't. Yeah, you kill a cow. It's that's life. It is literally. And you get food for a year. You do. You have one one life can support so many people for the per, for so long. Um, yeah. So and grass based ruminants are the best ones for that because it's the largest animal. It's the least amount of death. And in the meantime, the entire cycle of life is made stronger. And we've had to make this this like terrible distinction here where we're trying to get out of the cycle of life by saying, oh, I want my life to be death free. And the real trauma for me was in facing that that is not possible. No matter what I was eating, something was gonna die. And that was horrible to me as a vegan. And it became very apparent when I was trying to grow my own food, I couldn't do it without killing things. And it was horrible. And that's even setting aside the fact that plants are very alive and very sentient and they are our, our, our elders. You know, like a lot of traditional people talk about the trees as our grandparents. Um, and that's true. They came first and you know what they did? They built the atmosphere. They made That's sure right. they oxygen and then we came along. That's so they right. did all of that for us. That's why they're our elders is because they made our lives possible and they still make our lives possible. And what have we done to repay them? We've taken over all their territory. So there's nothing left. Um, yeah, so that that's, that's like the horror of it, right? Is that there has to be death for life. Yep. And you know, when I was still in the throes of coming to grips with that, which was very difficult, um, I mean, this just sounds like such a cliche, but I had a Native American friend and I was just unloading on her. Like, I can't, this is so hard for me to make peace with. And she just looked at me with like, it was compassion, but also pity. Like, God, you poor thing. Like, how can you be 35 years old and not know this, you know, level of just like, she's like, for something to live, something else has to die. And I was like, it was like so profound. And for her, it was like, you should have known this when you were three years old. Like you people are so pathetic. I was like, well, there was no one to tell me. Like, how was I supposed to know that? Right. Um, but then I had to sit with it. Like, she's right. I've already experienced this. I've already seen the truth of it, but now I have to actually absorb this concept. So really are, I'm gonna let my dog out cause she's barking. The only option really is, are you gonna be, is it the death that's destroying everything? And that's agriculture. That's the food I thought was the wonderful food when I was a vegan, um, but it's not. It's that's the food of death. The other death is the food that makes all of this stronger. It's the death that supports the cycle of life, and that would be like grass-based ruminants because that's what that cycle is. And we have to eat something. We cannot eat the grass. We are not ruminants. Um, right. We cannot just eat sunlight and minerals from down below. That would be the plants, but you and I cannot eat sunlight. I mean, we can't go outside and just say, hey, breakfast, thank you, sunshine. We can't do that. <laughs> I mean, what's in soil, right? What is it? It's dead plants and dead animals degraded by bacteria and then taken up again into plants. So, I mean, plants are eating dead animals. That's what good soil is. And if you garden, you know this, you need manure, you need bone meal, you need blood meal. It's horrible as a vegan because you don't, I couldn't face it. It was horrible. I was like, go and get these like organic amendments. Okay, I need them, I need them. And then I'd read the package and be like, what? What is this thing, blood meal? What is that? Is it what, what it sounds like? It was, it was horrible. But now it's like, yeah, that's what soil is. It's dead animals. Yeah, Where do right. you think they go? They go, right. we all, we all go back to the soil. That's, it's, that's the beauty of it. Like that's what we should just be in awe that we get to be part of this forever. We That's are right. recycled, like right every last molecule. It gives me such peace. I love it because one day 
I mean, I have like a family of hawks that lives here every year because I let the meadow be a meadow. So I've beautiful. The, the state grass of California is purple needle grass, which is this incredibly beautiful grass because it looks like a purple needle. It has this, wow. grasses are very subtle, but it is this sort of purple green color, especially the, there's this huge seed head, but it looks like a, a needle, like the eye of a needle. So the grass itself just looks like a giant needle with this beautiful purple color. Um, the purple fades, like once the, the seed head is opened, it just fades all back to green. But it's this amazing plant. I have it everywhere in my meadow is purple needle grass. I've tried to plant it too, but some of it was here. Anyway, I let the meadow come up. And what that means is that there's all these small mammals and reptiles and everybody lives in the grasses, all these grass dwelling little creatures. And I have a wetland too, so they come and go. It's like perfect. But it meant that the hawks could move in because of course they have to feed their babies. And you know what they're eating. I mean, they're just strict carnivores. So they want the baby buddies and they want the, you know, the, the baby mice and all this. So they've been there now for oh five or six years. Every year they're back and they raise another pair of babies and I can hear them. They make, you know, there's, there's this very eerie sound that this sort of high pitched little shriek that they all make, which I love. Wow. But they're here every year and it's, you know, it's because I've let this land repair so much. Um, but that's it. I love the idea that one day I am going to die. That's hard. It's hard for humans to face our mortality. But at the end of the day, um, I'll be part of it. I'll be part of the grasses. I will, the grass will eat me. And then other creatures are gonna eat that grass like the mice or the rabbits. And then the hawk is gonna eat the rabbits and I'll be part of a baby hawk. And what, what, yeah. why did I resist that knowledge? When right. I was a kid? Like, that's the most amazing thing that we get to be here forever. As long as the planet is here, some part of us will be here. We're just recycled. That's all it is. We're just getting recycled every time. Yeah. And yes, those moments are hard. Birth is hard. Death is harder. But you have to go through it if you want to be here. That's right. You That's have right. To, there's no way out. I mean, maybe you'll be a Buddha and then not have to reincarnate. I don't know. <laughs> you can believe what you want. We can't prove these things one way or another. Maybe that's a thing. And then we get to do that at some point. I, I don't know. But yeah. I do know that on this planet, we're going to get recycled <laughs> over and over and over. You're going to get to be all of those creatures at some point. You'll get to feed them. I'll get to feed the baby hawks and the baby mountain right. lions. So and cool. Just, I love that. I love it. It just gives me <clears throat> solace in the night to know that this hopefully will go on forever until the sun burns out and some part of me will be here for it. Yeah, I sure hope so as well. I mean, I just, I love the, the visual of, you know, the infinity sign tipped, you know, vertically where you see it go up and down and back into the ground and come back up. And, and you know, that should be something that recycles forever and ever and ever, as long as we take care of our planet, like you said. I would just so highly encourage every listener, to please, please, please read Lier's book. She goes into much greater detail on all of this stuff. It is really engaging. There's parts that are equally hysterical and terrifying all at the same time. You're um, I've had some gardening misadventures and, and oh, yours no. absolutely trump mine. The snail story, I never get sick of well, hearing. Oh, so know. good. The slug story. Um, but anyway, I would just highly encourage the listener to go and pick up the book Vegetarian Myth because it is, it is very well written. It's very well done. It, it, and it, it does have that component of being equal parts horrifying but equal parts hopeful and there are things that we can do and realizing that the narrative that we're told about about you know plant-based and doing everything plant-based is not necessarily the best thing for our health or for the planet and understanding how to reincorporate that is so so critical so I just really thank you for your work and your willingness to face that I know how difficult that kind of cognitive dissonance can be all the while seeing your health suffer and then coming out of the other side and being willing to like share that with people in a way that is a story i just i've got so much respect for that and i really am very grateful for you and your work and everything you've done which is so cool where mm -hmm. can people go to find you and connect with you and connect with your work and pick up the book sure so i have a website um and it's really easy it's learkeith.com but i say that as a joke because i have a really strange name and unless you figure out how to spell it you're not going to find it the easiest way to find it vegetarian myth there's one book with that title and it's mine. So if you just type in vegetarian myth, you'll find it on the first page. Um, but otherwise you can try to spell my name. Lierre is Pierre with an L. So it's L-I-E-R-R-E. -E. And then Keith is K-E-I-T-H. So that's the best way to find me though. It's just my book. Um, and then just my, my other books and my podcast things that I, all the interviews and the places I'm gonna be speaking and what it's all there. And you can buy Great. books if you want. And that's always fun. Also, I teach writing classes. So that's something you can- Oh, cool. So yeah, I didn't know that. That's great. Yeah.
Awesome. Very cool. Well, we will link to all that in the show notes to make that really easy. I would advise the listener to avoid any of the websites that have your picture with like, we talked about this last time, like blood coming out of your mouth, like you're like the Teenage Vampire series, you know, whatever, like there's, I love there's a lot of Teenage Vampire. I love, <laughs> he's one of my heroes. Before I you generated a hater or two, I'll just say that, uh, but we're still so grateful for you and this message and bringing this to light despite all the challenges and despite overcoming, again, all that cognitive dissonance. And so thank you so very much for everything you do. And thank you so much for appearing on our show again today. It's, it's just the highest honor to be able to talk to you. Thank you. Thank you. Absolutely. And this has been another episode of Balanced Body Radio.